You go. Okay, very good. All right, uh, so uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're covering chapter seven uh, in the book this week. Uh, the chapter is very similar to chapter six, where we're still looking at breakdown plots. Uh, the extra wrinkle that we're introducing this week is we're um, including interaction effects in these plots, uh, whereas chapter six, we were just kind of looking at those marginal additive effects. And so the layout of the chapter is, is very similar. There's a basic overview of what we're doing. Uh, we're going to provide some basic intuition uh, of, of you know what what the interfa interaction effects are, how they work, um, provide some examples using the Titanic data that we've been looking at um, in the previous chapters. Uh, we'll, we'll have a breakdown of, of how um, the, the contributions are, are calculated. Uh, then we'll wrap things up with a pro and cons list of, of uh, doing breakdown plots with, with interaction effects versus the, the marginal uh, that we looked at in chapter six. And uh, finally, we'll uh, look at a couple of examples using the R code that are presented uh, in, the, in chapter seven there. Any questions? Okay, let me um, make this a little bit smaller for you guys. That's as small as I can go here. Yeah, so uh, the book defines interaction as uh, a deviation from addi additivity. Um, so in other words, uh, you know, the, the effects of a given feature in our data set depends on, on the presence and value of another feature. Uh, in this book, they, they focus on pairwise interactions only. Uh, which I think is common for for most you know machine learning data science type type model exercises, but um, the authors make a point that you can extend this to um, higher order interactions. So if you wanted to include trios of variables together, um, you can do so. Um, this the procedure that will show um, can be extended um, if if necessary. And so to start things off. The authors um, have a simplified example using a, a subset of the Titanic data. What they do is they limit it to just the males. Um, and from there, they look at two variables, age and class. Um, age is you know, a, a, essentially a continuous variable. Uh, but but to, to keep things simple, what they do is they uh, bifurcate that into like a categorical variable. So we have boys, you know, uh, children from ages, you know, infant to uh, 16 years old, and then adults uh, over 16. Um, and then the, the class variable, rather than provide every level that we see in the, the data set, what they do is they just say, well, let's look at second class, and then everything else gets bucketed as another level. And so uh, the table that we're looking at here, it's, uh, this two-way table, is looking at the survival probabilities um, and broken out by, by you know, the, the different levels uh, in these synthetic variables that we just created here. Um, if you look at the bottom right here uh, from the data set, uh, you know, from from this population of males, the uh, the mean survival rate's a little over twenty percent. Um, and then if we look at the marginal survival rate for like second class, that's in the uh, column on top right here, it's 13 and a half percent. Um, we look at boys only, the marginal survival rate's 40.7%. Um, and so in this example, we are looking at a, a, a boy, um, we're trying to explain, um, you know, survival rate for a boy in second class. And so thinking through chapter six, how we might explain this, it, you know, you're going to have different uh, effects depending on whether or not you start with the uh, second class or the class variable, or you start with, um, 
you know the the age variable, which in this case is is really the boy designation as opposed to adult. So if you start with second class, uh, we see that the the marginal survival rate is thirteen and a half percent. You know, you calculate the additive effect by subtracting out like the grand mean survival rate, which is twenty point five percent. So you get a negative seven percent uh, effect uh, of of being in second class. Um, and so then now you have this this thirteen point five percent survival rate. Um, we know that second class boys survive at a ninety almost ninety two percent rate. Um, you subtract those two items, the ninety ninety one seven minus the thirteen five, um, and you get basically a seventy eight point two percent contribution uh, due to due to second class. All right. So if we start on the other hand with the uh, boy designation as our first variable, so uh, age being boy, um, we, you know, we see that uh, 40.7 is the survival rate uh, for boys. We subtract out the grand mean of 20.5, so we have an effect of 20.2%. Um, and then you know, uh, looking at the, the additional effect of, of boys, uh, it's it's ninety one point seven percent. We subtract out the marginal survival rate for boys of forty point seven percent, and we get fifty one percent. So uh, very different um, effects. Um, in fact, the 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 uh, direction actually changes for boys. In that first example, it's negative seven percent. Um, in the in the second uh, example, it's twenty percent. So it went from negative to positive. So that's can be problematic, right? When you're really trying to understand uh, model output here. Um, so order matters, right? We, we know that we saw that last week. And, and in this case in particular, there is an interaction effect going on and that's, that's why we're getting a different result depending on the order. So um, the, the fair class depends on age and age depends on class. Uh, you know, hence, hence the, the interaction effect there. And so using this really simple data set, we can calculate uh, the, the net interaction effect of second, second class and boys together. Um, what we first do is we look at the survival rate for second class and boys. It's 91.7%. Subtract out you know, the global mean survival rate, 20.5%, we were left with 71% essentially. Uh, but then what you wanna do is to, to calculate the net interaction effect, you subtract out the marginal additive effects uh, of boys uh, and um, second class. So that's, uh, we, we, we showed that earlier, negative 7% and 20.2%. Um, so you subtract those two components from the 71.2 and you're left with 58% of a net interaction effect, which is uh, quite large um, in this case. Um, and I just wanted to point out, um, if there were no inter interaction effects at all, we, we could just um, simply add up the, uh, the contribution rate, uh, uh, the, the, the marginal contribution uh, rates uh, described earlier, the negative seven and the, the 20.2%, uh, which would leave us with 33.7%. Um, we know that's not the case. Uh, here, right, uh, because of the, the presence of that large interaction effect, it's 58%, and that gets us to the overall uh, survival rate for boys in second class of, of about 92%. Hopefully that made sense. Any any questions here? No, no, that's, you know, a really clever way that the book explained that, that case. It reminds me to the total probability class, like, oh, you... You you can take the total and you you rest the individual part so you know what is the effect that you are receiving for that interaction. So it's a really simple way to to explain that difference rather than just have the thirty three percent that you have in the additive, and it's more a, a safer way to interpret the results because. Uh, for real, based on the additive model, you really don't know 
if you it is convenient to be a boy or not to be a boy because you will have different effects. But the reality that being a boy is good if you are also in the second class. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, a good combination to have <laughs> if you were actually on the Titanic, mm -hmm. without a doubt. <laughs> Um, I do have one question. If we go back to, I think I might be reading this wrong, but if we go back mm -hmm. to um the additive explanation one, mm -hmm. um, uh, let's can we also go back to the table for a moment? Yep. Yeah. So um, so the, just the overall survival rate is about twenty percent, and but and this table mm -hmm. says um like the the added the survival rate the probability of survival for a second class is 13 percent yeah so um i'm so i'm a bit confused by the first bullet then it says there that the marginal probability for a second class is 13 percent. okay that's what the table says so the effects of boys is seven percent should that be reading the the effects ah, of yes yep yeah, that's a typo okay. thank you i will uh fix that uh before i submit this thing yes th that is the effect of second class Okay. Um. And 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 so I, I think both yeah. of these bullets are a little little backwards. Okay. So this this should be um boys here. This should be second class. Good call yeah. out. Thank you. Um. Yeah. One other thing is if we scroll back to the bottom of how we calculated the interaction effects. Mm -hmm. So we did that by cal. We did that by getting the um. We did that by subtracting ninety one minus twenty point five to get seventy one percent. And then, yeah. if we just want to isolate the interaction effects, we subtract out the individual, individual effects. So, yeah. Uh, my question is, um, the the negative seven percent and then the twenty percent. That's just one set of the. That's those are the um additive effects for like just one of the two orders. If we use yes. the other numbers, would we get the same results? I think we would, right? When you say other numbers, I mean from like from the added effects of explanation two. I see. Any any thoughts from from others here? Uh, you mean I, I don't understand the question. Could you repeat, please? Yeah. So um, I'm yeah I'm looking at how we calculate the net interaction effects, and mm -hmm. we did that by get it, by subtracting from seventy percent. That's the that's the combi that's the effect from um like doing both boys and second class, and so from that seventy percent, we subtract out the seven percent and the twenty percent, and those are the um those are the effects of according to explanation one. Those are the effects of um second class and the effects of boys. But what if we instead use the numbers from explanation two, where I think the difference is that we change the order, so we have difference additive effects. Okay, I think I understood. The point is that you need to take the first class, the first variable that you are picking for each each time. So, mm -hmm. for example, in explanation one, they start with the class. So you will just need the change for the class. Mm -hmm. In the example two, they start with with the with the age. So you will just use the age because uh, you remember that the the other effect depends on the prior. And you mm -hmm. want the probability that is independent. Yeah. That's why you cannot use the other way around. Oh, OK. Great. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Great, we'll uh, move on here, making sure I didn't speed up. Um, skip, skip any slides here. Okay, um, and so the book proceeds to describe, uh, you know, a method for calculating these net interaction effects, and we we just did that um, in that previous example. This just really formalizes uh, what we're doing. Um, you know, first you, you need to make sure you have the additive contribution of each single variable, um, and again, that's that's really the deviation. You know, since we're looking at Titanic data set, our our, our um, target here is uh, is survival probability. Um, it's 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 the deviation from the global mean again. 
um, as opposed to the absolute uh, value uh, for, for, a, for a given feature value. Um, so we know how to do that. And then the net interaction effect uh, is calculated. Uh, and this is, <laughs> I put in my own, uh, you know, abbreviations here, uh, really for my own learning. So this may confuse folks here, but, um, you know, I think a lot of the, the notation and formulas in the book are, can be confusing. So I just tried to pare it down to the, the bare essentials here. So, um, you know, you need to determine the, the contribution for each pair of explanatory variables. Um, and I call that PC here. Um, and if we go back to table we were just looking at, that would really be second class and boys together at 91.7%, right? Um, and then you need the two components uh, that we described in, in step one. Uh, uh, so I'm calling that single single contribution one or SC1, and then the, the um, contribution from the second variable SC2. Um, you put that together into one equation, uh, the net interaction effect is that paired contribution calculated initially subtracting out the, the, the marginal additive components. Um, so it, it's some pretty simple arithmetic, but it looks a little hairy when you um, use the author's notation in the, in the book. Okay, and then um, you know, ultimately what you wanna do is calculate uh, variable importance. Um, and what happens is this procedure also involves a bit of a heuristic um, where you wanna take the, um, you're ranking contributions of each of these variables by the absolute value um, that we're calculating for the contributions. And so we're, we're stacking up contributions from the individual variables and then the, the net interaction effects together, um, looking at the absolute values um, and then kind of sorting those and taking the, um, sorting those in a descending order uh, so that the, the higher magnitude values are, are gonna be kind of earlier in your uh, breakdown plots. Um, and, and as you're calculating variable importance, those higher magnitude contributions uh, will be used first. Hopefully that makes sense in my <laughs> personal notation here didn't confuse anybody. Okay, hearing silence. So hopefully that's a good thing. All right, so the, the book moves forward with another example here, um, less of a toy example in this case. Um, here, we're not just creating, you know, two simplified variables. It's, it's really, I think it's seven, maybe eight variables that were included in um, the random forest model that was detailed a couple chapters ago, I think. Um, and so here again, Titanic data set, random forest model, and we're trying to explain uh, survival prediction for Johnny D. It's a fictitious pack passenger um, that was also described in the book uh, earlier on. And um, so the book shows you uh, all of these contribution calculations uh, for, for each variable. Um, if I scroll down, you see this table is quite large uh, because it includes uh, each variable separately and then also every pairwise interaction. So it, it gets, it, it's pretty big despite the fact that we, we really don't have a, a, a truly large set of features that we're exploring here. And so uh, here's a lay of the land uh, of what we're seeing in the table. So that first column is, is, is the variable that we're considering. Um, you know, here it's just age or the third uh, row here is class. Um, but if we see, you know, something separated by a colon, uh, you know, that's common R notation when we're building models, this is denoting a, 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 an interaction effect. Um, in this case, the interaction of fair and, and class. Um, and so again, this is, this is the, uh, the books notation uh, for, for contribution effects. Uh, it, it is a bit confusing. So um, my definition here, column two is really that paired variable contribution. Um, so if we're looking at just the straight up variable in our, in our data, like age, it's blank. Um, it's only gonna be populated where we're truly looking at a, an interaction here. And uh, if, if we think back to like that toy example we saw, 
where boys in second class survived at a rate of um, 91 or 92%. That's what would be calculated here, subtracting out the, uh, you know, the global mean. Um, so we call that the paired variable contribution. Moving over to the, the rightmost column, we have uh, the single variable contributions. Again, that's in this case, it would be survival rate minus the, the global mean. And then this third column here uh, is really that net interacting interaction effect that we're most interested in. Um, and you can just calculate this uh, by taking the components in the second and fourth columns together. So at the end of the day, we don't really care about the, the second column here for the purposes of the breakdown plot or variable importance calculations, but we do need this as, as a intermediate step uh, in calculating uh, you know, the net interaction here. Okay. And uh, just, just to be clear, uh, this is somewhat redundant with what we described earlier, but like, you know, if, if we wanted to uh, use this table um, to, to, to calculate the net interaction effect of, of fair and age together, we look at column four, you know, pull the, the fair contribution, we'd pull the age contribution, um, and then we'd look at the, in column two, that the pairwise contribution of fair and age together. We look at that formula that we, we talked about earlier, where you, you take the pairwise interaction contribution minus the two marginal additive effects, and you get the net effect, um, right? So um, in this case, negative uh, 16.4%. Okay, so we have this large table, um, and then we want to reduce this, uh, you know, to to uh, produce the the variable importance calculations. Um, what surprised me initially here is that this table is much much smaller, um, and we're not looking at all of those pairwise interactions. And this is something that that the authors don't really dwell on in the chapter, but you know, this is part of the heuristic. Um, and, and how they're um, kind of displaying the order of things and, and re removing some variables. Um, so I, I just made an ordered list of kind of how this works. So we had that larger table that, uh, earlier and we um, want to rank uh, and sort variables uh, based on the absolute value of the contribution. And so just scrolling up real quick from that table, um, it's already sorted uh, based on the absolute uh, magnitude in, in columns uh, three and four together. So you see like age is 27%, uh, fair in class is negative uh, 23%. So, you know, this goes in descending order of magnitude. So once we do that, um, kind of the way this, this heuristic works is that you're only including each variable once. Um, so you don't see like uh, like fair in this case separately because we've determined that fair in class together is an important you know has an important contribution to the uh, the, the total uh, survival rate here. Um, so so we just include fair in class um, and not fair separately and class separately. Um, Curious if any of you have thoughts on that. I mean, I think from a visual standpoint, um, that makes uh, interpretation a lot easier. You know, that, that table above was, was pretty big. And I would think in, if you're dealing with realistically sized data sets with many, many features, that, that gets really difficult to, to view here. So, um, you know, really in this case, fair and class together had a, a pretty a high, contribution together relative to just fair in class alone. So we, we only include the interaction effect. And uh, the procedure for calculating variable importance is the same as we saw in the, the, the previous chapter once we've kind of isolated um, uh, everything here in terms of uh, the contributions. Um, so I yeah, won't go th that's through really the good processor. Because they say that the in this case intervention was bigger than the individual elements, so they don't mean the the elements. So to, to don't confuse your interpretation. Yep, yep, and um, and so here is the you know the, the breakdown plot 
uh, summary here. Um, I think we're pretty familiar at this point. Um, you know, in this case, age obviously is a huge <laughs> contributing factor to um, um, determining the uh, the overall prediction for this individual Johnny D. Uh, Forty two percent here. Um, any questions on any of what I just went went through over the last couple minutes here? Uh, Aaron, just one observation. Uh, it looks pretty similar to the breakdown plot that we were discussing in chapter six, right? Yeah, and uh, in in fact, uh, the only difference is that fair class interaction. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I you know now that you say that it would have been interesting to to pull in so we could do a side by side. Right. Uh, to see how how different you know the the variables are kind of working. Um, with and without interactions. And I did do that uh, later on here. And we'll see with, with Henry, which is the other instance mm -hmm. example that we've been looking at. And you're right, right. even there, I mean, it's, it's very similar. Uh, it's just that you have one interaction effect that was deemed important. And, right. um, and, and yeah, honestly, I, I would think for, for those two examples, I don't know if the choice really mattered. You know, we know that these were employing heuristics either way, whether or not we're including interactions or just looking at those marginal effects. Um, right. But I, I don't know if that's always going to be the case, right? It, it just, I, I almost feel like it would have been <laughs> better to see multiple examples where the interactions really mattered and then maybe right. another example where, where, where it didn't. Right, but uh, at least here, you know, you're considering that, that interaction, which is, uh, you know, which is meaningful. Yes, yes, yeah. it is quite meaningful in this case. Absolutely. Yeah. So one thing I did think of is that we only see um one interaction effects here. Um, I'm assuming that, I'm I'm pretty sure that like, like, when we put this chart together, we just we. We we calculate the other interactions and we can and we can assume that they're close enough to zero that they pretty much don't matter. But I think it's unlikely that all of those will be like exactly zero. So one question I have for this is that when is the interaction effects like small enough that we can just consider it negligible? Well, I don't know if we're really throwing out interaction effects here. Again, this is this is kind of where the heuristic comes to play. It comes yeah. into play. We we've we've ranked things in terms of their their contribution, and you know here fair and class kind of rank to the top. Yeah, and it, it you know it was higher than uh, the you know fair and and class separately. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think what what is happening really is. You know, that the variable importance calculation is is really including both the the interaction effect and the marginal effects together. Yeah. Hopefully, I'm describing that appropriately. So I don't think we're throwing anything out. It's just that we are we're kind of combining marginal and interaction effects together in some cases. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's that's really kind of what we're we're showing here. Ho hopefully, does anyone disagree with my interpretation there? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I think you have it right here. Um, I think I might've just gotten confused, honestly. Um, yeah, 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 that's, mm -hmm. but honestly, you know, that's a really good point. Uh, and that, that was my initial reaction as well is that, you know, we, are we just throwing things out? Are we using like a threshold to say, here are important, you know, variables and anything that just falls below a certain threshold, we just don't include it, but that's not, not what is happening here. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, yeah. We, they, we, don't, they, we don't have a statistic test to validate this because in this case, we just taking what the mother, it's like, if you are sure that your mother is accurate, you know, that is showing the reality, and this is what the, your mother have, you don't may, might not have a statistic test to see if that happens always, but you have a high probability to have mm -hmm. and repeat that result. So maybe that the that is more related to the mother accuracy. You can repeat that part with the, with the mother. I, I think that would be the point 
in the size of the feds, the, 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 the size is no like, it's relative. So as you are changing from, oh, you have eight age and then you have the interaction effect. It's like maybe the interaction could be larger, larger mm -hmm. if you change the order, you know, of the variables. So the magnitude here is not maybe the most important thing because maybe you have a short, but a really important and persistent uh, variable. Maybe by changing the order of the variables, you might see if something is persistent because uh, this is not a exact sign. Uh, that's the point. Yeah, yeah, it's not an exact science. I, I do think, mm -hmm. Zach, I mean, we could really do this this uh, table that we're looking at here, this table 7.3, and include all of the variables in this large table, and we would get uh, a different result. Um, I don't know if that, the model that they train had just that variables, because I think it was really similar. They didn't have all that. Or maybe they just discard the interactions. This, I mean, this is only like seven or eight variables total. And it's okay. just, there are a lot of pairwise interactions going on, yeah. which is why this table is it's so, so, so big. big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they but, don't make the interactions. That does it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But my point is, I, Zach, I think we, we could kind of change the procedure if we wanted to, um, where, where we didn't, we, we, we just kind of, you know, stack things up this way. Um, fair class would still be the second, but we would throw class in here and not remove it. Mm. Um, and we would, it would be interesting to see how different, uh, you know, the very variable importance measures would, would shake out uh, if you included everything in here. And that's why I'm saying like the way they've kind of simplified things. I don't think we're, we're not explicitly really throwing things out. I think it gets absorbed. Yeah. Um, in some of these uh, these measures here. Yeah, it gets absorbed because at the end, you need to have your original prediction, you know? Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, mm -hmm. this the if we look 42. at the fair, fair class row here, this 54.4, that, that's a survival probability for, mm -hmm. for folks that are age eight, right? And have a fair of 72 and are in first class. Exactly. Um, so it is, yeah, so. it is, you know, taking into consideration yeah all of these elements, it's just, yeah, we're really collapsing the interaction and some of those marginal effects kind of together and calculating that importance measure. Um, and again, I, I, I've still kind of struggled. The, the, the authors don't dwell on this much um, in the, in the text, but like, you know, how different would this be if we went the more complex route? <laughs> I don't, I don't know uh, mm -hmm. what that would look like other than I think it would be harder to interpret it, right? Cause it would just be so, so big. Um, I think that's the correct approach. They think, oh, you, you have two options. Or you take the single effect of the variable, or you take the interaction. You you cannot take both. Yeah. That, yeah. that thing, the, the approach, maybe by the experience, you know. So that's the recommendation by the authors. They say, oh, you have the individual variable, or you are interpreting the interaction. Yeah, that, that's right. I think, you know, part of the confusion maybe for you, Zach, I know for me certainly is like when you think about regression modeling, you always learn like linear regression that if you include an interaction effect, <laughs> you always include the marginal effects as well. It's just, you know, and, you know, I'd have to <laughs> refer to my notes for why you always do that, but that is, that is considered a best practice um right you don't just include the interaction effect ah uh, yeah you're right mm -hmm. and it's kind of similar like if you're 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 um taking like the square of a feature you generally would include the the non-squared version of that as well mm, the base yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I exactly so i think i think that's kind of an apples to apples comparison but i think that probably in the back of our heads when we think about that, it just, it seems strange. Um, but, but again, I, I do think we are really including the, the marginal and interaction effects here. It's just, this is more of a heuristic um, and, and how we're ordering uh, these items. So we, so we get the, the variable importance.
Yeah, I think another, yeah, I think another issue is just that if we try to include like both like the individuals and every interaction, like that would get very long. Like that would be like, we have like eight variables here. We'd need to include like 64 plus eight variables yep. if we want to include everything. Yeah, so yep. I think the point of this is just to like, is just to present the, presents the explainers in a concise and informative way. Yeah. It's not, it, it, at some point it doesn't really help to like try to include everything. Yeah. Uh, agreed. Um, you know, it, again, it is a heuristic, <laughs> Yeah. you know, I think we're all analytical people though. And we kind of want to understand why the <laughs> heuristic mm -hmm. is employed and, yeah. um, and we're kind of, we're kind of making our own inferences here. I do think you're, you're onto something there with the getting to a, a, a very condensed uh, form of this plot. Cause if you, you make it too big and you can see with seven or eight variables, this thing would blow up if you included everything uh, that it yeah. would be hard to interpret. Okay. Um, uh, and I see some of my bullets uh, need some adjusting <laughs> in my markdown. Mm -hmm. I always struggle with uh, bullets, um, but um, here are some pros and cons uh, of, of uh, you know these um, breakdown plots with interaction effects. Um, and, and some of the some of these these are carried over straight from chapter six. Um, you know, one of the pros being that this is a, a model agnostic approach. Um, you know, it can be this this can be calculated on any any model type. Um, the interaction effects potentially can be more accurate um, than than just looking at those um, marginal additive effects, um, which, which is great. Um, and you know these these plots in general. This is not necessarily more true of interactive, sorry, interaction plots as opposed to the the marginal uh, plots, but they can be fairly easy to interpret in general. And then if we look at some cons, um, this is you know more complex. You know there in terms of just um, probably time of computation, it gets pretty difficult because you know you see here um, th this formula. Uh, for for how many contributions you actually need to calculate between, you know, individual variables and the interaction effects. Um, so if you had seven features you're looking at, you know, uh, that would be what seven times eight, fifty six, uh, divided by two, twenty eight, um, separate items that you need to calculate. And um, you know, you thinking about real world data sets where you have so many features and it's a large data set to begin with with millions of, of uh, records that could be a, a real challenge and I think you know that the time of, of calculation I'd, I'd really like to run this Dalex function on a really large data set with tons of features to see if it, if it um, can be run in a sufficiently you know short amount of time I I, I don't know if folks on here I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit but we're going to be looking at things like partial dependence plots later and I, I've certainly used those um, in my prior work and uh, those can take a very long time <laughs> to run. Um, and, and so, you know, the Titanic data set is, is quite small, so this is not really an issue, but um, you, you always have to consider that the practical, like how long is this gonna take um, and whether or not you actually wanna include the interactions. I'd, I'd say for this type being, of point. I don't know how much time do you say that was much like an hour, two hours? Uh, I'm an impatient person, so I don't like waiting that long. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's all relative, depending, you know, if, if this is a work you're doing for a client or, you know, you are you have a, a pretty tight deadline for something, that may or may not be a big deal. Um, if you have, if you're many months away from your deadline, yeah, an hour or two is fine. But, you know, if this is running a couple days, like that's, that's. No, that's horrible. I, I don't even I like when I have any piece of code that take more than one minute. I like this is taking too much. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. I I, I hear you. It, yeah. Certainly. I I I don't like waiting myself. Um, but you know, and, I, for more power. Uh, yeah. I, I would prefer to wait more. But like you you don't need to run this every time. You just need to do it one or twice. Yep. Well. Yes, although if you're kind of going through that model revising process, the, the explanation will always change, right? As you, you know, we're looking at a random forest model, for instance, in this 
uh, in this example based on like seven variables. But if we were to introduce like another variable or a couple, couple more, you know, no, those explanations changed. would mm -hmm. change. So you would have to run this again as you tune tune that model a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, an another con here is that, so we talked about like you potentially could get more accuracy by throwing in those interaction effects, but like data gets pretty sparse, you know, once you're looking at, you know, pairwise interactions where you just might not have a lot of interactions in your training data. So it's it's kind of this very uh, bias variance trade off thing uh, that you always hear about, you know, with machine learning or statistics, where yes, you, to a point you can gain accuracy, um, but you can overdo it <laughs> as well, um, and you ultimately end up attributing signal to noise. Um, so that's just one of the thing, one of the the call outs um, in the book. And of course, if you have a really small data set you probably don't want to um, model a lot of interactions. Um, and then, you know, a couple other items, you know, the procedure that we're, we walk through is, is not based on a formal statistical test. Uh, it is, again, it relies on heuristics as we've talked about. Um, and you could end up with uh, essentially false positives, explanations that, that are really, you're getting a value that's, that's really random noise. Um, so, so false positives, you know, showing, uh, maybe a strong effect that really isn't there. Um, and the call out in the book is that for, um, small data sets, you're more likely to get false negatives where you're not really showing any importance for variables that do, do have importance overall. It's just, you can't get there with the, the data set on hand. Um, you know, and then, then as we, we discussed, like, if you have a lot of variables, the, the plots can get out of hand. And if, if we really didn't apply that summarization procedure <laughs> that we that that is kind of part of the heuristic, um, where you either look at the interaction or the marginal effect and not but not both, like this thing would get really un unwieldy and hard to interpret. Okay. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the the R code because this is is very similar to what we looked at last week. Um, it's, it's pretty nice that the authors, um, kind of give you their, their wrangled Titanic data set off the bat. So we don't have to go through that process. I mean, we just read that in using this archivist package. Um, and similarly, like you can just read in their, their random forest model and not have to build it yourself. So, you know, I did that here, just like you saw in the book and, um, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, the explain function uh, is, you know, very similar. Um, in fact, I think this is the exact same code from chapter six, uh, where you're just basically pointing to the model, um, saying what your features are, and where your um, target variable is. So, um, yeah, very simple there. And the only difference in the predict parts function. Uh, to, to produce these these breakdown plots is that you 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 indicate um, type is breakdown interactions, and uh, I'd have to go back, but I, I think without the interactions, you just don't have this <laughs> suffix at the end here where it just might be like breakdown as your type. Um, and and again, this example here is for Henry uh, as opposed to Johnny D that we looked at earlier, and I don't have a side by side comparison, but. Um, the what what I'm doing is I'm I'm looking at yeah I'm looking at that breakdown without the interactions. Can make this any smaller. I think this is as small as we'll go. Um, but the point here is, yeah. You can it, open two browsers together side by side. <laughs> I guess I could do that. Um, but the the point here is, you know, we're getting a very similar. Oh, here we go. Uh, there was the the important interaction here was fair and um, an embarked kind of the embarked location and the fair amount, ten point seven uh, percent contributing to the overall prediction. With without it, you know, embarked alone is ten and a half percent. So in my mind, 
I, I don't know if this was really, you know, if the juice was worth the squeeze and in, in, including that interaction here, because you're basically getting this, this, the same amount here. Um, and so, yeah, so, so because we had this interaction, we don't see embarked or fair separately. And then if we scroll down here, fair was negative 0 0.03. So a really small, um, imp, uh, you know, contribution overall uh, to that predicted output. So I, I would argue that this, you know, it did not matter in this instance. I, I, we, we talked earlier about it would have been helpful to see cases where you would get a significant um, kind of deviation uh, in terms of the buildup. But in this case, it's pretty much the same. Elias, zero point zero zero two more, because like one hundred five, you are getting the interaction with one hundred seven. Mm -hmm. So right now, reducing zero point zero three, you are adding. That's right. That's right. Yep. So yeah, it, it changed the interpretation, you know. It it does slightly. It's just not huge in this case. No, it's not huge. huge. The the firm. So in the first case, you think that the fur has a positive effect in surviving. But in the other one, you are concluding that it has a negative one. So that's the difference, I think. Okay. Okay, because I think that the, the numbers is, is not important. It's the, the side of the Fed. Yeah, I think I think this is really these these plots are about order of magnitude. Uh, you know, there there is not really precision uh, here, but you know, again, I think of the example where like maybe you know if if you're working as a data scientist or statistician or you know, whatever, just you're a quantitative person in your respective field and you need to explain this to, you know, someone internally to your company or to an external client, like you need to be able to explain why your model outputted what, what it did. And I think this is a pretty good tool, particularly in those cases where you're getting strange output, right. That maybe are counterintuitive. Um, this can, lead you down the right road, certainly to explanation, but you know, this could also help uncover maybe an error or something that's wrong, right? Maybe <laughs> maybe the data that, that you have that was used to construct the model is wrong. Um, you know, it's just it's just kind of a, a way to look in the black box. Um, you know, just to see if if this really aligns with what you would expect from domain expertise or through, you know, prior modeling or, or something like that. Uh, I think it's a really interesting tool. Um, but, but again, yeah, I, I would just, you know, take the, the absolute numbers that you're getting out of these, uh, plots, um, as you know, with a grain of salt, it's not going to be, it's not going to be exact because we're, we're kind of condensing things, making, making some shortcuts, applying these heuristics to get there. All right, and uh, that is all I had. And I think that that wraps up uh, these breakdown plots. Um, just as an aside, um, I have this other book that I have not really gotten far in, but I was aware of before this book. It's called Interpretable Machine Learning. If you, you just Google that, um, it's another free um, book that's, um, you know, I think produced in, in, in Bookdown. And, um, I think same general idea as this book, you know, trying to understand um, how black box models work. And uh, it didn't look like that author of, of uh, interpretable machine learning um, tackled breakdown plots. Um, and I'm curious, just, just a question to the group here, if, if you've ever used breakdown plots before, um, you know, for fun or in your jobs or, you know, school or, or whatever. I mean, have you used these uh, before and do you think these are, are pretty mainstream tools? Mm -mm. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah, this is, I don't think so. Yeah, pretty pretty new for, for everybody here. Okay, yeah, I was yeah, just, I, just curious. I can, I can say that I've used, uh, you know, the global, you know, very important. Uh, different ways to uh, calculate it, and also uh, Shapley. Yeah, which gives you uh, you know something kind of similar 
you know, like breakdown plots, but they're called their uh, force plots. And uh, it's it's a more sophisticated tool because you know it uses uh, simulations, you know, game theory. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it, it introduces randomness, you know, to the to the construction of the of of in quotes something similar to the break on plots. Um, one of the things that I, Angel, you know, uh, commented, and I think is very important, is that we are not getting any any statistical significance here on this breakdown plots. In other words, you just get that value, that mean value, but you don't get a range, okay, on how, you know, uh, how accurate is that that uh, that that prediction, and that's something that you should be you should be aware. In this uh, breakdown plots, now now that I'm you know uh, watching this uh, this chapter of interaction, okay. Yeah, so I'm, I'm I, you know something your... something to have in the back of your mind, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, agreed. I, right. I'm wondering if you know the 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 reason why the authors put this breakdown plots first is because maybe they're easier to understand. Right. But but once we move to more advanced. Uh, items like you like you mentioned the, the Shapley uh, values mm -hmm. like yeah you know, uh, maybe, uh, maybe if you understand that like you never go back <laughs> you don't use right uh, yeah I think it's more like a scaffolding you know uh, a technique yeah. you know st starting with some basics uh, uh, foundational uh, uh, theory and and seeing visually the application uh, uh, you know in a, in a in a in a very uh, transparent manner. And then going to the, you know, to the to the real stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That 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 makes sense. Um, right. I'm in the chat. I just want to put in uh, interpretable uh, machine learning book. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's just one I've seen referenced in the in the past. Uh, um, I, I'm sure we all have uh, tons of free time to <laughs> read uh, another book, particularly for the folks that are doing multiple book clubs here but um just just fyi if you're you're interested i've uh, just briefly scanned that thing and i hope to to look at it in more detail um as time allows uh, i believe that that's one of the books that we we, we discuss about it yeah we consider for this book club yeah. okay yeah the point is that it doesn't have code for example so yes yeah i think that's one of the downsides i mean this Book club, of course, focuses on R, and I, I do think you need to you need that hands on. This is how you code this stuff, as opposed to just maybe the theory uh, and intuition behind it. So I, I think you guys, you know, um, did a good job in, in, in narrowing it down, and I think the book's been pretty pretty good so far. It was a slow slow going at first. <laughs> the first couple of chapters, I was kind of eager to get into the nuts and bolts, uh, but I, I think we're there already. So. Um, it's been good since we kind of got into breakdown plots in particular. Yes, great. And also, you are explaining a chapter that is also related to that book. You can use it oh. as a reference or maybe add it to your presentation, you know, because both, so you have two references to the same theory. So, yeah, yep. it would be important to check out also. But I really like the way that this book explains starting with a simple example and then he explained you the formula so even the notation sometimes is hard to understand you really get it thanks to the example yeah, yeah. that and the daleks package uh, you know i think the real test is going to be does that thing scale well to huge data sets um but i mean the the syntax for it is really simple um and so that's that's kind of exciting right from a workflow perspective you don't have to know that much to, to run the functions in there. No, and when you understand the basics, you can stay and maybe explore the another option that could be faster, but you know the in general. So you don't, you are not just, you can focus on learning the theory and one way to do it, maybe then you can interact to doing another way that works for you. Yep. Yep. I agreed. Agreed. <laughs> well, guys.